incredible weather this week, isn't it? Always is. Always is. Yeah, you're right. Life is amazing. Hey, do you ever feel like something is off, like things could be different? No, not really, dude. Are you feeling okay? Yeah, it's just- You can't have a rainbow without Ryan, baby. Oi, what the spark? I think you need to have a talk to Ryan. It's gotten into you all of a sudden. I'll drink to that. Super villain pun. When I played Xenoblade Chronicles, it became the first game ever to give me goosebumps, and it did it over and over again. When I played Xenoblade Chronicles 2, it became the second game ever to give me goosebumps. And when I played Xenoblade Chronicles 3, it shot me in the heart, and it did it over and over again. And I liked it. The 3 is for the number of times I cried. Xenoblade Chronicles is a vast, incredible Nintendo book. Ah! And the newest entry in the franchise is an impossibly great culmination of everything that came before it, a product of so many unlikely contributing factors that its existence could have been easily prevented by decisions made three decades prior. After completing their work on Final Fantasy VI, Tetsuya Takahashi and Kaori Tanaka created a new story scenario that they proposed as Final Fantasy VII. It was rejected for being too complicated, but it was still greenlit into development as a sequel to Chrono Trigger. It's a common misconception that the scenario they wrote was inspired by a shared interest in psychology and philosophy, but what actually happened was Takahashi was struck with divine inspiration to create the scene where Tora activates Poppy and realized it wouldn't make sense without 400 hours of game lore building up to that moment. They wanted to create a new world of their own, so the project eventually moved away from Chrono and became Xenogears. I haven't played it yet, but I'm pretty sure it's a really special game. This was during the era where Square abandoned Nintendo in favor of Sony, so Xenogears was released as a PlayStation exclusive, making use of the new CD format. Over time, Square shifted their focus heavily towards Final Fantasy, drying up the funding pool for other creative projects. Takahashi was unsatisfied with the new direction, so in order to continue the Xeno franchise with creative freedom, he started the development company Monolith Soft with the support of Namco. Here the team created the Xenogears spiritual successor, Xenosaga, and the rest was history. The series didn't perform very well commercially or critically, and after the merger of Bandai and Namco, the company underwent internal changes that pushed away Monolith Soft, who had been rekindling their relationship with the Mario Company. They struck a deal, and Nintendo became Monolith's majority shareholder, securing the studio's software exclusivity. They worked on several non-Xeno projects, including some major Nintendo games, leading up to 2006 where Takahashi began a new large-scale project, Monado, Beginning of the World. Their concept of a world atop two warring gods was initially met with resistance for being too big, until Nintendo was persuaded to give the team full support, eventually adopting the Xeno moniker to become Xenoblade. There was a lot that led up to this moment. It's pretty surprising that Nintendo became so on board with a spiritual successor to a Square game and a Namco franchise from Sony consoles being made for their first console with Wii Balance Board support. But what's not surprising for this era was Xenoblade not being planned for release in North America. It's widespread knowledge by now, but fans were passionately against this, but were way into the idea of this. Operation Rainfall was their solution. A campaign started to convince companies to release a trio of Wii games in North America. The Last Story, Pandora's Tower, and Xenoblade Chronicles. People sent letters, campaigned on social media, spammed pre Orders, news outlets reported on it worldwide. Nintendo pushed back at first, but it was ultimately successful for all three, though it's not clear exactly how much Operation Rainfall was responsible for the games being published in the region. The gold lining of it working out this way is the franchise being uniquely British, since Nintendo of Europe did the English localization. The multi-year launch of Xenoblade Chronicles continued to receive universal acclaim, later being ported as the first new 3DS exclusive, and finally receiving an extremely high quality release on Nintendo Switch that kind of rides the line between remaster and remake. Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition. This is a brilliant, delicious, endlessly charming video game, and someday I'll realize it's one of my all-time favorites. Xenoblade immediately draws you into the world of the Bionis by introducing you to the relationship between these childhood friends, Shulk, Ryan, Dunban, and Fiora, and lulls you into a sense of security with the Monado's unbeatable power, only to hit you in the gut, push you on the ground, and rip away the complacency it built up. And this is where I first got goosebumps, and realized what I was in for. The early chapters in this game hold the player captive to expect the adventure of a lifetime, perfectly scored by some of the best composers in the industry, and it never pulls its finger off the trigger. Video games were going through puberty in 2010, so in Definitive Edition, they upgraded the original gritty art direction to be closer to Xenoblade 2. People have criticized the animeification of this game, but to me it feels like Definitive Edition is what they would have always wanted the game to look like if the Wii was more capable. Wii Melia isn't real, she can't hurt you, s**t. 
The series was quiet for a few years after Xenoblade's release until the highest point of the Wii U's lifespan, E3 2014. Smash 4, Amiibo, A Good Yoshi Game, Captain Toad, Breath of the Wild, Not Mother 3, Bayonetta 2, Hyrule Warriors, Clay Kirby, Mario Maker, Splatoon, and the letter X. Much like Xenosaga was to Xenogears, Xenoblade Chronicles X is a spiritual successor sort of spin-off of Xenoblade Chronicles. Showing off the expanding ambition and talent at Monolith Soft, they took the underpowered hardware of the Wii U and squeezed in this enormous, meaty open world. Unfortunately, my Wii U was raised vegan. I, I don't know. I think the easiest way to approach Xenoblade 2 is to use the words of Takahashi himself. If Xenoblade Chronicles was a straight A student, the second one is not quite that. It's by far the most controversial arm of the franchise. You either love or hate this game, and depending on the day, I find myself doing both. I never actually hate Xenoblade 2. I love this game, but that's embarrassing to admit, and I hate that. Some of Xenoblade's greatest moments are in this game. The big, huge, playful worlds of the Titans on the Cloud Sea are stunning, and most of the characters are undeniably lovable, just with polarizing designs and execution, to put it lightly. The Anthropomorphic weapons known as blades that are at the forefront of the game with Pyra and Mithra are not only weirdly literally objectifying, but are also a gacha mechanic, because of course? There could maybe have been some good commentary done here, but instead it's just a comfortably convoluted system that spit out some character designs that would understandably give a hardcore Xenoblade Wii enjoyer several heart attacks. Seeing as the largest section of my best video is about this character, I find some of the artistic choices in this game to be lazy at best, and actively working against the talented unified vision of its creators at worst. In the first 10 hours of this game, I continue to fear that I wasted $100 on Awkward Anime Moment Sim 2017, but it got way, way better. Thank God. Morag, Zeke, and Poppy isolated from Tora carried until Chapter 8, and then Laura swept. The next Xenoblade was part DLC, part standalone prequel, Torna, the Golden Country. It started development as a playable flashback sequence in Xenoblade 2, but the scope grew too large and they pushed it to become DLC. Takahashi recommended treating it as such, playing it midway through the game after the end of Chapter 7. This is how I did it, and it was glorious. Torna is a more refined, digestible, bite-sized JRPG that makes a great argument for games really needing permission to be shorter. The protagonist Laura is a hopeful, relatable character who the player already knows the fate of. The entire cast's average age is older than most JRPGs. I love them. Having a party that is almost entirely grown adults gives Torna a unique identity where it doesn't feel any rush to develop its characters in its 15-hour duration. These are people that have already been through a lot and are prepared to go through a lot more. A lack of significant character progression is aided by the knowledge that these characters either tragically die or continue to evolve 500 years later. The battle system is the same as it'll play but more engaging. The music feels like the base game's brilliance dialed to 11. The explorable titans are simply more refined due to both technical advancements and better quality of life decisions. When Torna is considered as part of the whole of Xenoblade Chronicles 2, I think the entry stands as a triumphantly great JRPG, which makes its shortcomings all the more unfortunate. If you passionately hate Xenoblade 2 or would die to defend it, here's what you should do. Step 1. Go to the comment section or Twitter, type out your thoughts, get into it, be emotional. Everyone wants to hear exactly what you believe. Step 0. Unplug your keyboard. And step two, do not come to my funeral. I heard a theory that I don't know the legitimacy of at all that Nintendo let Monolith Soft just do whatever they wanted on Switch after helping out with Breath of the Wild's tech, which is why Xenoblade 2 turned out like it did, and I think that's really funny, so I'm not going to figure out if it's true or not. I remember finishing the game, seeing how it tied back to Xenoblade 1 and the potential it had, and thought, wow, this could become Nintendo's own Dragon Quest slash Final Fantasy. Number three is going to be something else. It was. Now for the part you're here for, or maybe you got here because your friend told you it gets really good at the end, dude. To enhance my enjoyment of Xenoblade 3, I played a drinking game. I took a shot every time a Nopon was annoying. Today, I'm 12 years sober. This is a game that lives and dies by its restraint, and it confidently defines its themes and your expectations from hour one. War. Opening the game in the middle of a large battle between Kevis and Agnes puts you right into the action and sets the tone. You watch these faceless soldiers literally fade away into nothing, facing the reality of war before even getting a chance to meet these characters. If you're normal, hopefully you're watching this thinking, wow, f war. And the game acknowledges your feelings by meeting you halfway with Noah, one of the protagonists who seems to also feel trepidation about senseless killing. It contrasts the brutal nature of the reality you've been thrown into with Noah, a soul who is immediately understood as compassionate because of his role as an officer, a member of the army responsible for musically sending the dead back to their creators. It shows him so uniquely empathetic for humanity that he even goes out of his way to send off the fallen enemy. Why are you like this, Noah? It's Agnes. It then drops the news that these people have a lifespan of 10 years, knowing nothing but the reality of fighting to survive and feeding the flame clocks that bind them, to inevitably die at the end of their 10th term in a ceremony known as homecoming. And they're all marked with an indicator to constantly remind them of how much time they have left. 
it's messed up. And Noah continues to show that he's riding the same wavelength as you, seeming to be the only person who suspects that the entire structure of the world is flawed. Where Xenoblade 2 took hours of exposition to make me care, I was already hooked, lined, and sank on the third cutscene of this game. Part of it is I'm a sucker for this kind of story. I'll just say it. I love death as a theme in games. And Xenoblade 3 was clearly marking itself as something special before I even had the chance to be skeptical of it. Then, in the cutscene immediately following, Xenoblade 3 pushed me against the wall and said, This ain't your slightly older brother, Xenoblade. This is the most tasteful obligatory bath scene I have ever witnessed, which means by simply not being weird, Xenoblade 3 was doing radical genre and series tropes subversion. The restraint compared to Xenoblade 2, as well as other series contradictions like Noah beginning with his Xenoblade rather than having to find it, continues to shout at the player that you do not know what you're in for. This is something big and foreign. Something Xeno. No, no, this is actually mind-blowing. It shouldn't be, it really shouldn't, but it's so hard to believe that the same people who made that went on to make this right after. There is almost none of that fanservice of previous games, but instead Xenoblade 3 glistens with this fanservice, the kind that truly respects and services fans. The third Xenoblade is an all-you-can-eat buffet of elements of its predecessors, being the best of literally both worlds. Kevis is a nation formed by elements of Xenoblade 1, as Agnes is by Xenoblade 2, both adopting the aesthetics and technologies of their games. Kevis is ruled by Melia, a main party member from the first game, and its people resemble the ones of the Bionis and Makonis. Contrasted with Agnes with Nia at the crown, and its people being cat-like or blade-like, the new world of Ionios is home to the fallen titans of the Cloud Sea paired with the landscapes and structures of Xenoblade Ones. For Noah, Lons, and Yuni, the worlds collide when they meet up with the opposing Agnes party, where they jump right into their instincts of fighting to live. A mysterious man who has been invisibly alive longer than 10 years gives the group the power of the Ouroboros, freeing them from the time flame and forcing them to cooperate, revealing another major theme of Xenoblade 3 and opening up the combat to its true mechanical form. Kavesi arts are round and charge over time, just as his combat worked for Shulk and his friends. Agni and Arch charge through auto attacks and are square, like Xenoblade 2. Xenoblade is essentially a turn-based RPG loosely pretending to be an action game, being a positioning-based evolution of the action turn-based style pioneered by Final Fantasy. Loose is important here because while having tight controls is often associated with fun action combat, there's a power to the looseness of Xenoblade's MMO-adjacent design. You have enough control over one character at any time that you feel in full control of them, but there's still so many contributing factors that you don't feel in total control of the battle. When you lose, it feels like maybe it wasn't your fault. When you win, it feels like maybe it was your fault. You leave every battle hoping to eventually make both completely your fault, and that drive becomes more addicting as you taste the control of new abilities either by leveling up or progressing the story. Japanese role-playing games have a long history of characterization through mechanical design choices, and many use combat roles to quietly display friendship dynamics. Xenoblade 3 uses them to show how fluid they are and how these empty vessels of war children make each other better. In the starting roles for each of these characters, there are light contradictions. Noah seems to be peaceful and not safe for killing, but he's the attacker. Yuni appears blunt, a little aggressive, and has a gun, but it's for healing. Senna is small and has the physical strength of Lance, who uses his sword gun to defend. Tyon fights with characters from Paper Mario the Origami King, but he's clearly someone who would bring up the thousand year door on a first date. Some of these should signal to the player that there's more to them than meets the eye, and understand that they're all incomplete without the other. Uni's day's attack depends on Lance's topple, which depends on Noah's break. The player understands that Noah begins the big damage combos because he's the leader and the dynamic of healer, defender, and attacker breaks down if a single one fails to show up. The order of Noah's break into Lance's topple into Uni's break is the same as the attacker first drawing aggro in combat, the defender taking it away to get hit, and the healer mending their HP. Once the six begin to bond, they gain access to each other's classes. This lets them share their skills around the group and inherit from the heroes met around the world, filling in the gaps in everyone's abilities and perspectives. Their affinities for new classes rise as these former enemies grow to accept each other, putting them literally in each other's shoes. Well, I guess I lied, it's not actually their shoes, it's shirts. And mechs. Everyone is each other's blade, a refreshing change for Xenoblade 2. Master arts unlock for each character as they spend time in new classes, giving Kevesi access to the arts of Agnes and vice versa. Their powers can be paired in fusion arts that do big damage in small time. The entire heart, soul, and butter of Xenoblade 3 is hidden somewhere in here, and it's up to the player to decide how much they want to think about it. Optional thinking is a pretty big part of Xenoblade. Some of the magic of complicated gameplay systems is that it tricks your brain into being relaxed by flooding out stressful thoughts. Immersing into complex numbers is one of the fastest legal ways to forget about the real world and transport your mind into a virtual one. And Ionios is a world worth getting lost in. Like, wow, I can feel Monoliths off passively aggressively telling Nintendo that they're ready for new hardware 5,000 miles away. One of Monoliths' greatest strengths is the sense of scale in these games. Even on the Wii, they managed to make the world feel overwhelmingly huge. 
Whereas previous adventures took place on massive moving titans, here they've been grounded onto this almost seamless new world. There's still loading screens between the major areas, but they clearly put a lot of care into giving the illusion of seamlessness because of how all the massive monuments feel contextualized in this role-playing sandbox. JRPGs traditionally treat the world as simply the dish to serve extravagant narrative cuisine. For Xenoblade 3, they pulled out the fine china. There's so much beauty and detail and verticality in this world. Areas are loaded with secrets, items are littered everywhere, you can see enemies from really far away, which is very weird for a Switch game. They figured out early on that you can encourage exploration even beyond raw curiosity by making discovering new areas give the same thing that battling does, practically replacing traditional XP grinding with the option to just explore a bit before going on to the next quest. Takahashi has said that one of the core concepts of the series is creating immersion in the game world to make the player want to stay there. They try to achieve this with big things like the extravagance of environments and towns, and with little things like almost every NPC having a name and making your party feel real when they say their cute contextual voice lines. 15 hours into this game, I was already terrified of seeing its end, so I think it worked. There's an undeniable quality to Xenoblade 3, so much care in the details in every corner of the game. Each character has an iris, which is basically an AR contact lens that lets them communicate and scan stuff, but it also explains user interface functions like the destination path, health bars, the minimap, even the menus. Since the UI that you can see features the same design as the iris interface, it kinda seems like the stuff you can see is the stuff they can see. I like that. It even contextualizes saving as Mio writing down their progress in a notebook. When gamey functions like this are given in-game explanations, it adds such an extra spice of quality to the package and also kinda a thoughtful meta layer. There's more here that I won't spoil, but like, when a game does something that vaguely reminds me of the idea of Nier, I catch feelings. Also, Persona 4. I won't spoil it either though. Yet. This all adds up to a package that stands as a uniquely, unconditionally great modern RPG. The pacing is divine, they manage to build up this huge war story without ever leaving the player behind, and once it starts, it refuses to stop. The emotional depth that's always been present in the franchise's highest moments has been brought to the forefront, stuffing every moment of its experience with the same magic that gave me goosebumps before. The characters are as lovable as they come, with great writing and equally great voice acting. The soundtrack that's as enormous as its world feels like an instant classic, any given song has the same heart and soul of the masterpieces of its genre. Every part of this game feels like its creators were told this was the end, this was the last game they could ever make, and they gave it everything they had. The extreme care placed into its creation and resolving the first Xenoblade trilogy by paying homage to both previous games almost feels like it's fanfiction, and it kind of is. You can tell the creators are deeply passionate about this series, they love it even more than we do. AAA games like these don't grow on trees, like, games like this don't get made often anymore. It's amazing it even exists at all, the franchise probably wouldn't have made it this far if fans didn't campaign to get that silly Monado game released in America, and if Nintendo didn't see the potential in Monolith off, if Namco and Bandai didn't merge, if Final Fantasy didn't become such a monolith, if Nintendo had given the N64 a CD drive, if the video game market died like it should have in 83 instead of becoming the largest media industry, if Takahashi's father was sterile, if Xenogears actually became Chrono Trigger 2 or didn't leave Japan because of its religious themes. Game development is already so difficult, it's a miracle any game reaches the market at all. Xenoblade 3 shouldn't exist. Nothing should. Every little thing that happens depended on infinitely many other things that depended on uncountably many other things, and if any occurrence along that chain was severed, things could be completely different. Why did this game happen but so many others didn't? Silent Hills, Star Wars 1313, Among Us 2, Prey 2, Fable Legends, and Skillbound never saw the light of day. Did they deserve it? Art can change the world. It's unlikely a video game has, yet. One of the tens of thousands of cancelled games could have been the first. Stories affect people, who make things and decide things. Art influences the flow of the world. This is Pablo Picasso. He was a painter and a sculptor. His impact on the art world was larger than anyone prior. He painted this, this, and this. This is Guernica. It is regarded as the most powerful anti-war painting in history. He had thoughts on the way the world worked, and war, obviously. This is Guernica. At the end of his turn, all he had left to do was pass the baton. By perfect circumstance, these six kids were there, and the last thing he could do to change the world was pass on the will of the Ouroboros so they could take on the true enemy. The Ouroboros is an ancient symbol depicting the cycle of destruction and rebirth, a serpent devouring itself, representative of the never-ending war between Kevis and Agnes, with its soldiers needing to kill to live. The world at war rejects the Ouroboros kids, taking away their predetermined fate. They were born with an inherent acceptance, their end being in ten years, the dark curtain of purpose was integral to their existence, never knowing the reality of choice. The world is bad. Huh, I never thought of it like that. This contrasts with us. Real people go through life's journey of accepting death. Some have religion, spirituality. Some don't. We can fear it, embrace it, try to escape it, pretend to accept it, probably dabble in them all along the way. Xenoblade 3 is a coming-of-age road trip adventure disguised as Xenoblade, where the characters set out thinking that coming-of-age meant fading into the abyss. 
When they became Ouroboros and were faced with meaninglessness and no set end of the road, it was right before their own ends, forcing them to go on a journey of accepting life and figuring out how to forge their own path. No dude, I'm telling you, Super Mario Sunshine 5 A Flood in Time is going to blow the snuffing wind out of SMS4, Flood makes his splash back. Shortly, another Kvesi lifetime of yours will pass. You will look at the 3,653 days and be glad that eternity had an opening. Good thing you didn't call your mother. You didn't need to go to that place to do that thing. You'll be glad you played it defensively. Things will work out, eventually. You might still be alone, waiting to find meaning, but your passion will find you. Things find a way, eventually, like always. Luckily, your always is forever. On their trip across Ionios, the Ouroboros make friends and enrich the lives of everyone they meet, discovering the impact they can have on the world, discovering its flaws, and more importantly, trying to solve them. Saving the world is more than just preventing calamity, it's restructuring it at its very core. There's a cutscene titled Super Villain Pawn that casually throws around like three foundational concepts of philosophy showing how each of the Ouroboros have separately made progress in their minds after facing existentialist thoughts for the first time, being in that moment with their own individual purposes and found motivation. A cynic might look at the delivery and call it childish. Xenoblade is philosophy for kindergartners. I'd call it relatable. Xenoblade is nothing if not approachable. Even though they knew that death is inescapable and are always reminded of how fast it's approaching, they don't waste their chance and they all have their own perspectives on the one thing that unites everyone, the threat of the end. They do it not because they're gonna die, but because they're going to die. There's no resistance to their end because they discover meaning in it. Eternity is failure in Xenoblade 3. The main supervillain pawn is basically an embodiment of it. Everything comes to an end, every person, every idea, every boss fight, every character in this world, and even the game itself. You don't stop playing the game just because it's going to end, or maybe you do. You shouldn't. It wasn't worth playing unless that end is there for you and you can eventually reach it. Trust me on this, I may not even be close to an expert on life, but I finished a lot of games and never did I regret seeing them end. This might make it sound like I don't actually like these things, but JRPGs are a practice in perseverance. Knowing the payoff in the ending will be huge, but it's still about the journey. If you can make it through Xenoblade Chronicles 2, you can make it through anything. Life is short, and unfortunately the passage of time is not a god you can kill with your friends, but we shouldn't be here in the first place. You're lucky enough to be part of this blip of existence, one with video games, one with Xenoblade. If your father didn't say that one thing that one time, Wow, your birth didn't happen, but it did. Every little choice did. Good thing that dinosaur stepped on the right butterfly. Contrary to everything, you're alive right now, and I can say that because you're watching this video on a rock that shouldn't glow, but it does. The fact that we're here and I can say this to you is snuffing ridiculous. Xenoblade 3 shouldn't exist, and neither should you. But it does. And you do. Shortly, another Agnian lifetime of yours will pass, and you will look at the 3,653 days and remember that eternity was closed. Good thing you called your mother. You'll be glad you went to that place, did that thing. You'll be glad you took the initiative. I'll make things work out, eventually. You might still be alone, waiting to find meaning, but you're still looking. Things will find a way, eventually. Like always. Luckily, your always happened. Hey, I started a Patreon and some incredible people have signed up. If you want to get access to some bonuses, early previews, and see your name right here, consider becoming a patron to help support the content. I have the next 7 videos in the planning stages and Patreon will help give me the ability to create without catering too much to the YouTube algorithm. So massive thanks to all you beautiful patrons and to everyone else who's watching. All your support means the world, be it leaving a like, subscribing, or posting a comment to tell me how wrong I am for liking or not liking Xenoblade 2. I mean, actually do leave a comment about Xenoblade 3 if you liked it or didn't like it. I, I don't really know what people thought about this game. I haven't really been on the internet. I haven't really looked at what people think about this game that much. I assume people like it. It's it's really good, dude. Xenoblade 3 is a special game. So special that I had to write a note to remind myself how special it was in all caps. Sometimes a game comes along where it gives you everything you could ever want and more. Things you didn't even realize you wanted. And six weeks before it, one of the best RPGs of the modern generation dropped on the same console. And if you're thinking, yeah, okay, you're just saying that because you saw how the trilogy ended and are still riding off that hype. I wrote the previous sentence 20 hours in. I assumed our time was forever Naturally seemed forever Those happy days we spent together Cause you were always beside me Then suddenly